Before I get started on why we're here, you know, as I look out into the crowd, I just wish that the families of gun violence in this city got this much attention because that's who really deserves the amount of attention that we're giving to this particular incident. So this morning, I come to you not only as the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department, but also as a black man who spent his entire life living in the city of Chicago. I know the racial divide that exists here. I know how hard it's been for our city and our nation to come together. And I also know the disparities and I know the history. This announcement today recognizes that Empire actor Jesse Smollett took advantage of the pain and anger of racism to promote his career. I'm left hanging my head and asking why. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations? How could someone look at the hatred and suffering associated with that symbol and see an opportunity to manipulate that symbol to further his own public profile? How can an individual who's been embraced by the city of Chicago turn around and slap everyone in this city in the face by making these false chart claims? Bogus police reports cause real harm. They do harm to every legitimate victim who's in need of support by police and, and investigators as well as the citizens of this city. Chicago hosts one of the largest pride parades in the world, and we're proud of that as a police department and also as a city. We do not, nor will we ever tolerate hate in our city whether that hate is based on an individual's sexual orientation, race, or anything else. So I'm offended by what's happened, and I'm also angry. I love the city of Chicago and the Chicago Police Department, warts and all. But this publicity stunt was a scar that Chicago didn't earn and certainly didn't deserve. To make things worse, the accusations within this phony attack received national attention for weeks. Celebrities, news commentators, and even presidential candidates weighed in on something that was choreographed by an actor. First, Smollett attempted to gain attention by sending a false letter that relied on racial, homophobic, and political language. When that didn't work, Smollett paid $3,500 to stage this attack and drag Chicago's reputation through the mud in the process. And why? This stunt was orchestrated by Smollett because he was dissatisfied with his salary. So he concocted a story about being attacked. Now our city has problems, we know that. We have problems that have affected people from all walks of life, and we know that. But to put the national spotlight on Chicago for something that is both egregious and untrue is simply shameful. I'm also concerned about what this means moving forward for hate crimes. Now, of course, the Chicago Police Department will continue to investigate all reports of these types of incidents with the same amount of vigor that we did with this one. But my concern is that hate crimes will now publicly be met with a level of skepticism that previously didn't, occur, didn't happen. That said, Smollett was treated as a victim throughout this investigation until we received evidence that led detectives in another direction. I couldn't be more proud of the unrelenting detective work that went into this investigation, and I couldn't be more proud of every investigator that played a part in it. The detective work that we saw in this case is indicative of the work that our detectives do every day in this city. This case in particular involved hours of video evidence, which when combined with old-fashioned police work, uncovered the truth. These detectives deserve all the credit in the world for carefully analyzing the leads and the evidence for weeks before coming to their conclusion. I'd also like to thank the FBI for their help in this investigation. The FBI's partnership with CPD has been pivotal 
in this particular case. I only hope that the truth about what happened receives the same amount of attention that the hoax did. I'll continue to pray for this troubled young man who resorted to both drastic and illegal tactics to gain attention. I'll also continue to pray for our city, asking that we can move forward from this and begin to heal. And now I'd like to call up Commander Edward Watnicki, who personally led this patient and deliberate investigation to walk everyone through how the Chicago Police Department arrived at this point. Good morning, everyone. My name is Edward Wadnicki. I'm the commander of the Area Central Detective Division. I'm here to answer questions. Okay. The, bo the boss just corrected me. Give, give, please forgive me. I, I, I'm supposed to go through the timeline of our investigation. It's okay. <laughs> so, so here's where we are. Um, as you all know, on the early morning of February 29th at 2 o'clock in the morning, Jesse Smollett reported that he was the victim of a hate crime. Uh, detectives responded to the incident and, and interviewed him eventually at Northwestern Hospital, where he reported to us that, that uh, the, the uh, two, two uh, offenders yelled racial and homophobic and political uh, uh, statements at him and beat him, put a noose around his neck, and threw bleach on him, and then fled from the area. Um, we learned at the time that, uh, that uh, Jesse was not hurt other than scratches on his face, maybe some bruising, but no broken ribs or serious injuries. So we started a, a full-scale investigation into this hate crime, a very serious crime uh, in, in, anywhere. Uh, we, we quickly found two persons of interest on video that, uh, that we believed were the likely offenders in this case. We initially put out a seeking to identify, and we got this out in a community alert. We then started searching the area for video cameras and witnesses that could help us with our investigation. Uh, during that time frame, we, we interviewed over 100 individuals in a canvas of the area and a follow-up canvas as our investigation expanded. We located approximately 35 of our Chicago Police pod cameras in the area and in the areas that we determined these two, uh, these two persons of interest fled. We additionally found over 20 private sector cameras, and uh, I, I got to say that that was, that was super useful in this investigation. The city came together to investigate and help the police with this crime. It was because of these pod cameras, our investment in, in, into technology in the city of Chicago, and the, the uh, great... Uh, uh, assistance from the community in giving us those other cameras that led us to a really solid timeline of where our two persons of interest went. So in short, we were able to track them initially, initially forward. So after the crime, we were able to see that they fled uh, in a particular direction and eventually got into a cab. Our investigators located that, that cab, interviewed the cab driver, got some video out of that cab, followed that cab using all of these uh, surveillance cameras that are located throughout the city, the pod cameras, to an area up on the north side where they abruptly stopped the cab, got out, and walked on foot. Again, the community came together to provide us with security fo footage from their private cameras. So at that point, we then started tracking these two persons of interest backwards, backwards to where they came from. So we, we followed them walking around and eventually back to where they had gotten out of a cab. So that was another individual that we had to interview and another individual where we sought video. 
We continued to track that cab back to the point where the cab was tracked down by our two persons of interest in a rideshare car. We then followed up on the rideshare, and, and that was the lead that we needed in order to identify the two persons of interest. At that point, we had a, a real good timeline of where these two people went. We were able to put a name to both of these individuals, and it was at that time that we started, started looking at where they went uh, right, right, right after this event. We tracked them to going to O'Hare Airport and jumping on a flight to Nigeria. Our, our investigation led us to determine that they had purchased a round-trip ticket with them returning to Chicago on the 13th, so approximately two weeks after the, the incident. So that gave us a couple of weeks to try to continue to, to follow up on uh, any investigative lead, any, any investigative lead that would help us try to determine what happened in this incident. So while we were waiting for them to return, we executed, we executed over 50 search warrants and subpoenas working with our partners in the state's attorney's office, uh, phone records, social media records, and records on individuals to help us illuminate the, the, the likely uh, facts that occurred in this event. So moving forward to the 13th, we had a team in place uh, working with the FBI, Customs, and, and our partners out at the airport. Airport police helped us uh, tremendously. And uh, we, we were able to locate and identify these two individuals, these two persons of interest, when they entered back into the country, into the country at Customs. Uh, we took them into custody. We read them their rights. And they both initially asked for an attorney. They were brought to Area Central Detective Headquarters so that we could, uh, we could process them. And it was at that time that their attorney showed up. I think you've all seen her on the news the last couple of days. Uh, she came to us, and, and uh, after speaking with these two people of interest, she said that something smelled fishy. She did not think that they were the offenders, as were reported. She worked with us very, very closely to get to the point where she came to me and said, you really need to talk to these guys. I, I'm going to allow them to give you a video interview with us present, and we're going to have you hear their story. They are not offenders. They're victims. It was at that time that this investigation started to spin in, in a completely new direction. Uh, You've heard some of the statements that, that uh, their lawyer, Ms. Schmidt, has made, and, and it was at that time that we took the information that these two individuals provided to us, and we substantiated the timeline and the details that they gave to us in this interview. We were able to substantiate those things. We worked very, very closely with the state's attorney's office, we had been working very, very closely with the state's attorney's office for over a week at that point, and it was, it was then on the 15th, Friday the 15th, after, after approximately 47 hours uh, of them being in custody and hours of them meeting with us and telling us their story and documenting their story, did we release them without charging and I classified them no longer as suspects or persons of interest and as witnesses. So as is typical with any investigation, one would typically lock uh, these witnesses into a grand jury statement. Monday was a holiday, the 18th. Tuesday was the first day that we could, we could uh, attempt to do that. So we scheduled, we scheduled a a appointment with the grand jury, working again very closely with the 
state's attorney's office in this, and as you know, at the last minute, uh, uh, Jesse's lawyers called and said that they had uh, evidence to postpone the grand jury that they wanted to provide to us. It was at that time that they called us, and I met uh, with them, with a team of our detectives, and uh, essentially they gave us no new information. So I reported that back to the state's attorney's office, and it was at that time that we, we locked in both of these witnesses to the grand jury. They, I'm told they did, a, did an excellent job, and then the state's attorney's office approved charges against Jesse for the class four disorderly conduct false police report. We met with, the, with Jesse's attorneys and we arranged for him to turn himself in. And as you all know, he turned himself in at five o'clock this morning in the first district in Chicago. Today at 1.30, uh, Jesse will be going in front of a bond court judge and uh, the bond court hearing will be conducted at 26 in California.